So um, this is a little awkward. Uh, it's like um, following after uh, Gordie Howe passed the puck to Bobby Orr in triple overtime to score following uh, Professor Janica and uh, Curtin. Um, just before I get going, if we can flip over. Um, gosh, I'm just awfully grateful to Carl and Rick. You all made my career. I don't know where I would be um, if it wasn't for you guys. Um, thank God I didn't tear that carotid. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the invisible anatomy and the anatomy of the economy. It's an interesting topic, and it will it will lay a little segue to what the, both Professor Janico and uh, Curtin proposed. Please ignore the details and the nuances. We're going to go very quick and focus on the underlying principles. Quantification and metrics are the real drivers. I couldn't agree more with this idea of um, the difference between unquantifiable and quantifiable risks. The goal here is to develop repeatable process-driven algorithms um, that are iterative. And in order for us to do that, what we need to do put a number on things, understand its risk. To do that, you have to segment issues. Micro-segmentation, units of analysis, dividing into components of individual components and then reassembling them into systems is really the only ability to reduce how you do things differently, reducing variance, and to the extent that you can with risk reduction. And you'll notice I left the K out on purpose in risk because I don't think you can reduce risk completely with our current knowledge base right now. I also believe that the difference between artificial intelligence is what Professor Jonico identified as sentient learning. We're so far away from that. Uh, because of that unquantifiable certainty. Having said that, what I do believe is that there's a tremendous amount of science that lends itself extraordinarily to seeing the two truths in medicine, which at the end of the day are units of measurements. First is the anatomy, individual units that you can disassemble, understand, and visualize. And then the second are the physics and math which, which we, with which these change and you see. The concept of dual transformation really lends itself to the system assembly, which is just do the right thing for the patient. Understand it, measure it, then figure out the resources that go with it as a derivative and measure them, this concept of econometrics. These are my disclosures. Let's start with the anatomy. The anatomy really begins with the neural network, which can fundamentally micro-segment it into two components. An internal neural network, a white matter component that's endophytic, doesn't leave the brain, and an exophytic cranial nerve neural network, which is what we as skull-based surgeons really live on. As I start to think about this, the first thing to do is to spend the time segmenting this, understanding the individual components of the anatomy, which is what we did in the early 2000s, and then assemble them into a system. The system we assembled, the unit of measurement and classification was around the carotid. This led to the concept of the medial carotid plane, the sagittal plane, and then the lateral component. Note that the unit of measurement was the carotid. How wrong could we be? Now, we're going to go backwards in this to learn from it. As we started to understand this, we took that micro-segmentation and then subdivided it into individual modules. That modular approach, it, approach laid the foundation. That foundation we then quantified into clinical outcomes, probably the single most important paper of which was a series of 800 patients consecutively operated on by one team. What did we learn? The carotid was irrelevant. We just didn't blow the carotid out. What else we did we learn? The single measurement in that system of failure was a cranial nerve. We harmed cranial nerves. So what we then needed to do is to go back to the table and try and reassess the measurement that we needed. So we then divided the cranial nerve into a set of segments. The first macro segment was simply dividing it between a ventral and a dorsal component. Isolating in the sagittal plane, the DREZ, we said, well, wait, if we come from in front of it, then we have a root and a nasally. Whereas if we come dorsal to it, we now had a very rough basis of a new modular system that didn't use the carotid. We then took each individual cranial nerve, spent hundreds of hours back in the uh, anatomy lab, and then segmented that in the axial plane. Then within the axial plane, what we were able to do was really meet for the first time individual segmentation of the nerve, introducing this concept of a cisternal segment, a dural segment, and then an extra dural segment for each nerve. We identified a landmark called a tubercle, and then started to segment the nerve into its components. The cisternal segment now became medial to a tubercle. Turns out that that was in fact medial to the carotid in every case. The extra uh, dural and uh, dural segment lateral to the tubercle now became lateral to the carotid. So we have a new measurement system for understanding cranial nerves, but we couldn't see them. Fortunately, with some of the work that Dr. Curtin just pointed out, what we were able to now do is in fact see these for the first time. 
So the ability to now take the cisternal segment of the optic nerve, separate this in this meningioma, separate it from its dural segment, and do the same thing for the third nerve, now created a mechanism by which we could, for the first time, develop algorithms for attack and determine which component of these we were trying to um, address with the various different approaches. Took those systems, and then we parsed them, took the parsing, and then we blended them into really all 12 systems and created a 36-layered um, algorithm associated with the specific segment of the nerve that you're trying to address. What did that lead to? It took us back to the work that we did in the carotid, and then we superimposed that on top of our previous schedule uh, that we had built. In the end, what we wound up with is an algorithm, and the algorithm is embarrassingly, embarrassingly simple. It goes like this. If you're in front of the nerve and ventral and you're dorsal to the nerve, you probably should come from the front of the nerve and the top of the nerve. And it's just, it's a really embarrassing concept, right? If the lesion's in front of the nerve, come through the nose, and if the lesion isn't, don't come through the nose. What we then were able to do is to use the tubercle as an identifying component, target the component. So if you're now in the cisternal segment as opposed to the dural segment, we can now identify a specific module that we had built and then address an algorithm around targeting the nerve. This lends itself to a set of predictive analytics about how you should approach this. Realizing that this was but not even a third of the human brain, we then started to impart on an exact same story now for the endophytic neural network. The first part was to map the anatomy. The anatomy got grossly mapped into very, very large micro-segmentation, just like we did with the cranial nerves. How did that work? So what we did was we built a three-dimensional atlas with the nerves, and we were able to, for the first time, rotate the cranial um, nerves endophytically into the corpus callosum and the individual components into the parafarcicular space. This starts to look like what we did in the nose relative to the carotid. Really gross macro scale, essentially, is what we were doing. Um, the ability to do this in an automated fashion, 15 minutes or less, allowed us to now create new corridors. These corridors were then tested against outcomes as we did. We started to realize we were getting bad outcomes. Um, so that led us to trying to understand visualization pathways that improved it. In doing so, we started to look at the math of the way that light was being delivered. And what we learned that the physics of optics put us in a position where light delivery was really becoming a major problem. We were getting wide fields of view in narrow corridors, and that's what the endoscope was doing. And the microscope, however, afforded us these extraordinary deep fields of views, and we just couldn't get them with the microscope. The ability to move the endoscope in the nose compensated for the depth of field lost in the three-dimensional perception. The problem in the brain the endoscope did not work was because this thing called the brain that was in the way. We weren't in the sinus. And that obviated our ability to get deep fields of view. So why couldn't we combine the two and generate these um, exceptional volumes of view imaging? So rather than getting a single focal plane, what we're now getting are these expanded volumes of view. Converting that back to the operating room and the way that light was now being delivered, we were getting views into this kind of gray zone in the back that historically we weren't seeing, and we were converting them into these deep volumes of views at very, very high magnification. So given that physics, how do we translate that back to the operating room? We went back to vascular surgery. So in this particular case, what you're now seeing is from the M2 through the optic nerve back into the membrane of Liliquis in one single volume of view. But the shocker in this and very disturbing part was, sure, we could clip the aneurysm and everything went great. But what was really disturbing is as we started to um, work with this, we had to bring the microscope in in order to get fluorescein angiography at the end of the case before we left. And all of a sudden, we were starting to see under the microscope a yellow v v hue. So we had been operating in the yellow part of the optical spectrum for my entire career without realizing it. Um, and what we needed to do was to reconvert that. We went back and then said, why is that happening? And then applied virtual reality to some of these platforms. And as we did, we were starting to get views with the exascope that were truly remarkable. So in this case, a dorsal uh, vermian AVM we got very, very deep views, but for the first time, now what we were starting to see is simultaneous visualization across the light spectra. No longer limited from 650 to 800 nanometers, we were now extending from the 400 range all the way out to 900. So here's a very large malformation in the posterior fossa. As we start to resect this, we get a gray-white scale, not really helpful. As we then start to move from this gray-white scale, we can go back to an RGB scale. We can apply furosine with a handheld system. As we now do, you can see the vein filling 
in superimposed um, contextual anatomy with RGB scale, and the vein fills at the same rate as the artery. So that tells you that that AVM is very much alive. Um, and just in case you really weren't sure that it was alive, as soon as you bite into it, um, it'll remind you in a minute uh, here. And so instead of uh, leaving the operating room at that point, we wound up finding a residual. As you see here, you can see the AVM is very much alive at this point, uh, as it fills really quite early which creates a, a very significant problem. At the end, what we're able to then do, deal with the bleeding, and then get a final run in real time. So now we're combining multiple different optic modalities in order to take out this really complex lesion in order to optimize it for the patient. And here's the final run. You can now see that you've got a clean base, and the superior sagittal sinus fills uh, a lot later. And there's the final angiogram. So what this led us to is an entirely new paradigm um, in the operating room, where we're taking multimodal imaging, combining it simultaneously, and how do we now bring it back to this concept of um, segmentation? So what we do is we went back and analyzed over the last 75 years over 3,000 reports of skull-based procedures, 29 different approaches that were described with 150 different modifications. That's what the body of literature had accumulated. No mechanism of um, understanding an algorithm around it. So we built four mirrored algorithms uh, that we think uh, made sense to us. And they were an anterior medial, anterior lateral, lateral, and a posterior lateral on the dorsal side. And then if you were on the ventral side, they had their sisters um, and a nasally. What that allowed us to do is to put the unit of measurement that we had created a morbidity around, which was really the cranial nerves. So what we were able to do is to say, well, look, from the crystal galley to the superior orbital fissure, you can get access to, of one through three. Superior orbital fissure to um, really the lateral component that gets us to Meckel's cave, and then a, a lateral approach through the mastoid to the jugular foramen, and essentially to the 12th nerve through a posterior lateral window. What that did was for the first time, it gave us true consistency with how we were approaching each individual case rather than with a series of randomness. I'm not saying it's right, but at least we were doing the same thing over and over. What we then found up doing is to say, can we apply these same concepts back into the brainstem? So this is a young lady who presented uh, with a very large midbrain uh, lesion with a GCS of three. You know, and sometimes you're just wrong. It doesn't matter what algorithms you apply. We thought we could go through a superior cerebellar approach. Every piece of data suggested we should be able to reach there. And what happened when we got inside the operating room, uh, there was this very unexpected finding. And what happened with the patient's positioning that changed, the vein of Galen that you'll see here in a minute meets you dead on. And now you're stuck as you take this small vein down and you meet the vein of Galen directly. So it turns out that this was an unquantifiable risk. There was a level of uncertainty that we had met. There's no AI program that could have predicted that. This is why we still need humans in an operating room, because I'm not going to be able to take that vein of Galen. Thank God we had Melanie for multiple different reasons. Uh, she came in the operating room, pre-planned a new trajectory for us in real time. We went through the vermis, opened up the superior medullary valve through the vermis, inserted it into the third ventricle, and did an inverted third ventriculostomy from dilating the aqueduct. And that gave us direct access into the anterior portion of the venular recess in the third ventricle. That's a human being coming in and taking uncertainty and being able to guide us in real time for a target. And fortunately, this lady um, wound up doing really quite well. Again, going back to this concept, what does this really mean in the long run? I think two last thoughts. One is around this concept of innovation and measurement. Um, I just took the liberty of kind of looking at our experience, Rick, and many of our friends in Pittsburgh before we came. And I met with a really good friend of mine that's responsible for the leadership of Pittsburgh. So I may get the dates wrong a little bit, but the general themes are pretty accurate. When I think about innovation, there's this period where it's on the outer circle, and then we get adoption, and then it becomes commoditized. We all do it. So it turns out that my mentor, Professor Janetta, really began his work at UPMC in 1968, I'd offer to you that there's a 14-year cycle and a seven-and-a-half-year life cycle that occurs. As innovation now starts to move in, at about seven years, you teach, and then by 14 years, you get your first set of residents that are out there teaching everybody else, and it becomes a pretty big commodity. So in 1988, Professor Janicle and Shaker started the skull base work, and you all were teaching people, and seven years later, your residents were back out in the world teaching more people, and it turns out Dade went to... Switzerland and learned radio surgery 
and had his first set of gamma knife courses about seven years later, and his residence went out into the world, and um, some guy showed up in Pittsburgh, met with Carl and Rick, and fortunately didn't tear a carotid. Um, seven years later, we wound up hosting the first World Congress, and now it became a commodity. Probably my greatest accomplishment was training a neurologist to do endovascular, Tudor Joven, who seven years later became um, a really international person and started to grow it, and now I don't know what I'm gonna do. There's this big hole and there's a lot of seven year gaps left. And so, you know, our focus really has been since then is this concept of robotic and exoscopic surgery combined with this real area of econometrics and a focus on cellular transplantation therapy that we're working on. So with that said, and living in today's world, what does that mean for the economy? And we'll wrap up with the last few minutes. So what about the invisible anatomy of the economy? Can we do the same process, divide it into micro-segmentation, develop systems analytics to it, and apply it? And I think some of Professor Janico's um, predictions back in 2010 are gonna be prophetic, and you'll understand why. Uh, this is our current state in 2016 of what our performance was. How did we get there, and how are we doing? In fact, 2019, just as you predicted, was worse than 2016. We have more loss associated with it. Why is that? Because we have this appetite for bigger, better, bigger, better. And it turns out that the data shows that it actually doesn't always work. What we really need to do is to go back to the singular smallest micro segment that we need to, which is Medicare, and figure out a way to be able to deliver good care at that level, and then apply those same principles through risk mitigation strategies in order to survive. That means we have to understand the revenue streams. Charitable care, we don't get paid, and we shouldn't. In governmental care, we get paid a 1x, and in commercial, we get a paid 3x. ACA, in 2010, moved everybody over from left to right. Our operating margins went from 10 to 7%. Well, guess what? The tax bill moved everybody to the left when it was defunded. So the operating margins didn't go from 10 to 7. They went to 6 to 3, which is where most of us are sitting right now. That was a predictable event. So what does that tell you? That we're in trouble. It tells you that this is our highest non-wartime spending in the history of this country. And that tells you the face of which um, we need to make changes. This is our extended revenue spend over really our... Um, our actual revenue, and you can see what the projections are. When you dissect this out, it's devastating. Infrastructure is declining, but actually healthcare is tracking interest at a rate of one to one. So that tells us that we're probably gonna have a great deal of trouble in the period that Dr. Janico made his predictions. Our GDP expenditure went from about 11%, 13% to 18%. It's predicted to go to 22%, and we're about one in four healthcare dollars over what we can bear as we move forward. So what does that mean? That means it's a great time to be a neurosurgeon. Why? Because every other commodity in the rest of the healthcare space is gonna be declining. Even our spine colleagues are starting to see um, changes that are really dramatic. And the reason is because there's a large consumption in that space. We saw this year for the first time a delisting of spine codes from inpatient services to outpatient services, which is really going to have a huge impact. So when I apply these principles, what it really means is, yes, we can unitize and segment each one of these components, but if you look at the long, wrong segment, you get a perverse incentive. So when I look at volume in the early 60s, it leads me to a very bad outcome, both financially as well as clinically. When I do a margin, it actually helps me a little bit. When I start to look at clinical outcomes, I have a problem. I can't measure it in a quantifiable way, and therefore I create uncertainty, just as you described in a biological system. But to the extent that I can quantify it, I can quantify economic risk in real time as an aggregate, at least until I understand it, and create a currency of exchange that's associated with it. What that allows me to do is to change and drive behavior instantly by impacting the margin of an organization. In the end, machine learning algorithms and predictive analytics are subject to the smallest measurable reproducible certainty of risk that you can identify. And I do believe that we are gonna head to that and each of us is gonna be contained within it. I'll spare you the details other than the fact that it's been a fascinating um, growth in learning the healthcare economy. In the 60s when we were born, we were a clinical core business. Our unit of measurement at the end of the day was volume times revenue as a surrogate. We just made so much money, it didn't matter. The margins always showed up. What we did with that cash is we parked it into payer integrated systems. What happened with that? We made more cash. As Soon as that happened, we needed a place to stash it. The mattresses were getting full, so we put it into the economy. What happened? Most of us became VCs. 
So for every dollar in clinical, we were earning $2 in the market, and the market grew. What do you do now? You've got this big cash pile. Why don't you go on a buying spree? So we went on a buying spree with mergers. We introduced tremendous variance into the system because we weren't doing measurements. So the margin started to flip upside down. The insulation shifted, and all of a sudden, a phenomenon occurred. We went into cost reduction and stopped building buildings. And that gave us a quick flip on the margin that was unsustainable. The markets in 08 dipped. Soon as the markets dipped, we were then subsequently hit with a second hit, which was this ACA and reimbursement shift. As that occurred, the insulations now faded. And all of a sudden, we started to wound up in 3 and 2% margins. Here's the problem. We'd done our cost reductions. There was no more people to lay off. We couldn't stop building buildings anymore. So we, went all, we all put a bunch of uh, tens and hundreds of millions and wore jeans on Fridays uh, and showed up and hoped that innovation solutions and companies would show up. And most institutions lost between 60 to 80 million in their enterprises for for-profit uh, components. There has been no meaningful for-profit translation, in my opinion, from that vertical at all. So now what? Well, hospitals started to close. 2018 had the largest, largest hospital closure since 2008. Our prediction is one in three bricks and mortars will close over the next five years, because they should. What will happen next, and then we'll wrap up, is we just got to go back to looking after patients through the model that Dr. Jonico and Curtin described back in 1998, an integrated service applying the right technologies at the right time to generate measurements. And as soon as you do that, your margins will enhance. And this funny thing happens. It's called the bottom line. And it's an amazing little thing. You do the right thing for the patient with the right teams, and all of a sudden, you get good outcomes. You mitigate risk. And as soon as you mitigate risk, you measure it. And when you measure it, and you go back to the smallest unit of measurement, as we did with cranial nerves, the patients do better and the economics follow. And that measurement becomes this concept of enhanced econometrics. And I do believe that all of us are going to be subject to that and should be subject to that going forward. So thank you very much. Much appreciated.